Hey, Cypher here. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee is trying to do a lot of things. It is a powerful interpretation of American Indian assimilation policy, but it has its problems. This was a difficult movie to review because I'm a Western historian and I know just how sensitive of a topic this is. The book it's based on, by author D. Brown, was instrumental in destroying the orthodox view of Western history. I actually thought about covering this about a year ago, but then I turned away as soon as I read the book. But then a patron on Patreon by the name of Jeff Chang seemed to want to punish me by helping me pay for putting this thing together. So thanks for choosing this, and also, why did you have to choose this? <laughs> Buckle up, this is going to be a doozy, as you can probably tell by the timestamp. And before we get into it, since I know there's commenters already chomping at the bit, the proper term is American Indian. Native American only implies birthplace. Native merely means that you were born there, rather than indigeneity. I'm a native Californian myself, so using the term native works if you're talking about settlers versus natives, but it doesn't work today. This is standard terminology in the history field. Also, if you're confused about somebody who moves here from India, they are called Indian Americans as opposed to American Indians. Of course, there's the original Scandinavian term, scrailing, but no one uses that. And yes, there are many exonyms, including India itself. The indigenous term for India is Bharat. Bharat. Okay? Okay. So here's something cool you guys may not be aware of. I've already done an episode on the Sioux Wars, just not on this channel. I wrote and narrated it for Jabzy's channel while he did the animations. Be sure to check out his channel, so I'm just going to play it. Also, I'm going to add some on-screen notes, so take note of those notes. Uh -huh. While Americans expanded their territory and crossed the plains, the Sioux tribe remained fairly unaffected by American expansion until the California Gold Rush in the late 1840s. Americans began to cross Sioux lands, so in 1851 they signed a treaty at Fort Laramie with the United States that set their territorial boundaries and allowed travelers to pass and army forts to be built, all in exchange for an annuity from the U.S. But the first confrontation came near Fort Laramie in 1854, when soldiers tried to arrest tribesmen for theft. A dispute happened, the soldiers shot the chieftain, so the entire village massacred the soldiers, 31 in all. A year later, in response, the army raided a village of Sioux, killing 86 with 27 deaths of their own. Peace reigned till the Civil War when two wars broke out. The first happened in 1862 when the government failed to pay the annuity to the Dakota Sioux in Minnesota. So the Dakotas attacked a settlement and killed as many as 800 Americans. The U.S. Cavalry began a two-year-long war with several battles. Some Dakota warriors were captured and eventually 38 were hanged in the U.S.'s largest mass execution. Because of their continued belligerence, the Sioux were expelled from Minnesota altogether, but not without interning them for a year in wretched conditions. The next began after several tribes, including the Lakota Sioux, were forced into a treaty by show of force and malicious dealings, which made them lose their hunting rights in Colorado. Reading of settlements began in 1863 by a polyglot of tribes called Dog Warriors, but it was still fairly low level, at least until a fresh militia unit went to hunt down these raiders during the winter and came across a peaceful Indian encampment near a fort on Sand Creek. The militia slaughtered 160 of its inhabitants, and this in turn encouraged the dog warriors to kill many more Americans in retaliation. A general military presence was made, and the U.S. fought a guerrilla war for another couple of years in Colorado. Indians of numerous tribes, especially the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho from both wars, had fled to the mid-northwest. They continued raining along the Bozeman Trail, and the U.S. sent an expedition to stop them in 1865. It had a few successful battles and destroyed one village, but ultimately resulted in nothing. After a round of negotiations with a Sioux leader named Red Cloud failed, a second expedition fortified the trail and fought against raiding for two years. One attack managed to kill 81 U.S. soldiers at once. After some defeats of large-scale attacks, the Indians took to small raids again for the next year. In 1868, the U.S. abandoned the forts along the Powder River and made massive reservations for the Indians under Red Cloud. 
For nearly a decade, peace was maintained on the Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne reservations, covering all of western South Dakota. But in 1875, the U.S. sent an exploratory party under the command of George Custer into the Black Hills. There's gold in them, thar hills. And Custer leaked the information to the press, causing an illegal gold rush. Despite it being Indian territory, the Americans continued mining. So after a year of failed negotiations, the Indians under Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse began raiding encroaching Americans. President Grant responded by sending the cavalry, but the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho banded together to take on the U.S. Army. Most famously, they defeated the army at the Battle of Little Bighorn, where Colonel Custer made his so-called last stand. But most battles went the other way, and the Indians were beaten back into smaller and smaller territorial claims, until they could no longer resist the military and surrendered in 1877, ending the Great Sioux War. They would lose progressively more land until 1910. But many Indians despised their loss of land, so a prophet named Wavoka started a movement convincing many that it could be regained. They had a special dance that was supposed to summon the ghosts of their fallen and reignite territorial warfare in their favor. But in 1899, the U.S. government took even more land and many U.S. soldiers believed the ghost dance was a military movement and began shooting into a village near Wounded Knee Creek in 1890. This developed into a massacre as the survivors were hunted down and over 300 were killed, though the Sioux did kill 31 soldiers there. Angered, the Lakota launched raids on the U.S. Army, but the war ended quickly after very little fighting. The anger runs deep for the misdeeds of these wars. The U.S. gave 20 medals of honor to the murderers of Wounded Knee. A protest of these medals and numerous other issues developed into an armed standoff at Wounded Knee in 1973 that lasted for months. There were a couple of shootouts with a total of 17 casualties. The medals, by the way, have yet to be rescinded by the United States. Reflected in all of this, the current protest in Standing Rock have turned violent. We just don't have the information as of yet to say what is happening there. So that last bit dates the clip. In 2016, there was a massive protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline, which was going across upriver from the Standing Rock Reservation. Police definitely used excessive force on protesters in a manner reminiscent of Selma, Alabama in 1965. There was some pushback from protesters and many were arrested, but the source of the violence was clearly the police. The issue was usurped by Donald Trump, who ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to complete the pipeline, even though it was being protested. A $3.8 billion investment in American infrastructure that was stalled, and nobody thought any politician would have the guts to approve that final leg. And I just closed my eyes and said, do it. The remaining protesters were forced to evacuate the site on February 22, 2017. Given this movie was released in 2007 and the book in 1970, it is amazing how current an issue this is. But there is a further layer this movie covers, but is often missed with all this military history that the public is so fond of. The American Indian policy of the United States has evolved over the years. Prior to the Grant administration, generally the treaty system reigned, whereby signed agreements between various tribes in the United States would be created as though they were between sovereign states. Of course, the Supreme Court ruled that Indians were domestic dependent nations in 1831, and thereby wards of the United States. So these treaties were never actually treated as being on equal standing. This system gave way during the Grant administration to what was called the peace policy. In 1871, Congress passed a bill that stated, Hereafter, no Indian nation or tribe within the territory of the United States shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty. The reservation system was created here. Indian agents were sent to these reservations, as Grant said, to induce those still pursuing their old habits of life to embrace the only opportunity which has left them to avoid extermination. Essentially, the U.S. had begun to attempt the assimilation of American Indians. There was a strong belief that Indians were going extinct, not just by disease and ill treatment, but because they had not modernized quick enough. This policy was attempting to modernize them. People honestly believed that the peace policy was a humanitarian effort, 
The system relied on placing Indians on reservations. They were placated by rations and goods that were fraught with fiscal issues by a belligerent U.S. Congress. Any Indians found off-reservation were hunted down. As their land began to be brought under agriculture, they were supposed to be weaned from U.S. aid. In perhaps the worst violation of the separation between church and state in U.S. history, Christian priests were employed to run these reservations and convert the pagans under their charge to Christianity. Going to church was often mandated. This peace policy failed spectacularly in 1876 when the Great Sioux War broke out. Indian wars were constant during this period, but only a week prior to the U.S. celebrating its centennial, the Battle of Little Bighorn led to the well-publicized annihilation of almost half the 7th Cavalry under Colonel Custer. Greater assimilation of American Indians was demanded by humanitarians. Further and further appropriations bills were passed, removing more and more Indian sovereignty. Indian schools were established on the model created by the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879. Indian children were sent to these boarding schools to become Americanized and learn a trade deemed useful by U.S. politicians. Grant's policy had also been riddled with corruption, and that was further reformed as well. Newer policies were added with the Dawes Act, which aimed to divide Indian territories into specific private allotments of 160 acres. Since they were private, they could be sold to Americans. Even if tribes refused to allow allotments, they faced homesteaders after 1889. From decades of this abuse, a Paiute named Wavoka began spreading a spiritual dance called the Ghost Dance. Wivoka spoke of the end of U.S. expansion and the reincarnation of Jesus. The dance was supposed to hasten the rise of dead family members during the second coming that would end American encroachment. The concept spread like wildfire as a pan-tribal movement, though it had many permutations. Lakotas took up this dance. It began to scare the reservation administrator, Joseph McLaughlin, who sent Lakota policemen to arrest the famous war leader, Sitting Bull. That went horribly, ending in the killing of Sitting Bull and seven of his supporters, who managed to kill six of the Lakota policemen during the fight. Tensions were mounting, and the army was brought in. At one of the camps near Wounded Knee Creek, a weapons confiscation was attempted. We don't know what exactly started it, but it ended in that massacre that I mentioned in the Jabsy clip. This was the last significant outbreak of violence in the Indian Wars, but the policy of assimilation continued unabated. A private investigation commissioned by what's now known as the Brookings Institute in 1926, called the Merriam Report, was meant, as it stated, to explain the difficulties under which the Indian service has labored. Released in 1928, it found altogether too much evidence of real suffering and discontent to subscribe to the belief that the Indians are reasonably satisfied with their condition. It was a bombshell of a report, despite its constant references to Indians that are not adjusted to the economic and social system of the dominant white civilization. Something had to change. Hoover attempted to give greater aid, but the Depression a year later hindered his efforts. It was not until 1934 when what is called the Indian New Deal was created. It completely reorganized the reservation system, including giving self-government for those reservations. This didn't end assimilation efforts. Incentive policies were created to get Indians off reservations and become productive members of American society. Then Congress tried to deem various tribes no longer an active tribe. This is called the Termination Policy, which lasted into the 1960s and early 70s. Aid was also severely stifled by various congressional actions and eventually the inaction of Ronald Reagan. It was Reaganomics that brought us Indian casinos that remain a significant source of revenue for many reservations. Now as you can tell, I couldn't go into too much detail here because this is a long enough video as it is, but suffice it to say, you can see the lasting effects of assimilation policy, and the Wounded Knee Massacre stands as a symbol of that injustice. So that was some pretty dark history. I'm sure there'll be Americans, let alone foreigners, who've never heard of half of this. And there's a reason for that. 
Historians actively avoided this history for a long time. There were certainly voices that spoke out, even prominent historians. Helen Hunt Jackson was the figurehead of these dissident voices. Her book, A Century of Dishonor, was a fiery diatribe on the maltreatment of Indians, and it was published in 1881, though was never popular during her time. Jackson instead wrote Ramona, which as the former Ramona pageant historian Phil Burgandy once wrote, Jackson hoped her story would be a call to arms, an Uncle Tom's cabin of the American Indian that would lead to genuine government reform. Many reformers followed Jackson, but they were never the majority. For half a century, historians typically followed Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis, which glorified westward expansion. His theory was the foundation of the western genre in Hollywood, and still looms large in people's writing on the subject, including my own. I made a video on his theory, so we won't go into it here. But historians were chipping away at the frontier thesis very early on. Henry Nash Smith wrote his book on Western mythology and used Turner as a mythmaker for his final chapter, and that was in 1950. His spiritual successor, Richard Slotkin, would double down on this critique later, with the final book in his trilogy on the myth of regeneration through violence, which is also a good basis for understanding the rise and fall of the Western genre in Hollywood films. This eroding of Turner's thesis eventually led to the most popular break from him, and a turn to Helen Hunt Jackson's reformer ideology. But it wasn't a work of history. It was historical fiction. Little Big Man by Thomas Berger was released in 1964. It exemplified the revisionist trends that had been challenging Turner, but popularized it. The revisionist western was already growing as an answer to the standard John Wayne kind of fare. But this blended historical realism in with challenges movies like the Dollars trilogy presented. Suffice it to say, this is what undermined the Western from its very foundations and is still controversial today. Someday I'll make a video about why the Western genre was killed by historians. Someday. When Hollywood finally turned Berger's novel into a film, that same year, another bombshell hit the bookshelves. But this time, from a historian named D. Brown. He leaned heavily into the trend set forth by A Century of Dishonor, and created Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. The book is arguably even more fiery than Jackson's was almost a century earlier, but serves the same purpose. In the intro, Brown says, if the readers of this book should ever chance to see the poverty, the hopelessness, and the squalor of modern Indian reservations, they may find it possible to truly understand the reasons why. People bought it in droves. Revisionism was the new paradigm in Western history, and that meant people realized how troublesome Western films were. The genre died quickly thereafter, degenerating from glorious epics with sweeping narratives of progress. Let's go home, Debbie. all the way to satires uprooting the founding mythology of the entire genre. These are people of the land, the common clay of the New West. You know, morons. <laughs> By the time Patty Limerick wrote The Legacy of Conquest in 1987, she was only putting the final nail in Turner's coffin, well after the death of the Western. Essentially, D. Brown and Thomas Berger killed the Western. This movie is based on Brown's book, and the legacy it left, though the book barely covers assimilation policy, unlike the movie. The Indian must own his own piece of earth, Charles. Now I gotta say, I actually rather dislike the book. It's got a lot of problems, especially in terms of the noble savage trope. It's also just obnoxiously worded, where every adjective indicates how evil Americans were in Brown's view. It's just not fun to read when you are greeted with this on the first page, where he says, Over the next four centuries, 1492 to 1890, several million Europeans and their descendants undertook to enforce their ways upon the people of the New World. The oversimplification of history and angry adjective usage is present throughout the book, and this is actually fairly benign rhetoric compared to just a few pages later where he says, 
There, musical names remained forever fixed on the American land. But their bones were forgotten in a thousand burned villages, or lost in forests, fast disappearing before the axes of 20 million invaders. But acrimony was necessary to swerve scholarship into a more critical understanding of the past, and it really did change the direction of scholarship in a significant and lasting way. D. Brown is well remembered for that specific reason, even though, as one historiography says, the demeanor of professional historians towards the book was so stern that it retained little credibility in the academic community. Luckily, the movie avoids being overtly histrionic, with only one minor exception in the beginning. Once, there was no honor in killing. It manages to capture the essence of discontent over assimilation better than the book itself. It could only do so after a few decades, as scholarship matured enough to take advantage of better narratives. A smart thing to do with any adaptation is to narrow its scope to something that the filmmakers can handle. The book covers half a century of history for several tribes across the Trans-Mississippi West, but it covers the Sioux more than anyone else, so that is what the film focuses on. It does mash the Lakota and Dakota tribes together as though they are the same, but I think that is forgivable for what the film manages to cover. There is a lot of depth I can't go into here, and this review is already ridiculously long. Why don't you demand back the land in Minnesota where the Chippewa and others forced you from years before? The Black Hills are sacred land given to my people by Wachantonka. How very convenient to cloak your claims in spiritualism. Anyways, it really humanizes the story. The earth belongs to the white man. There is no future outside his world. Somehow, it manages to begin with the Great Sioux War of 1876 and continues past the Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890. And it does so without a crap ton of info cards all over the place. It might be bewildering to folks, especially if they haven't had the whole thing explained, like with this video, but they will grasp the basics. I have never seen something try to cover the assimilation policy, and this was fantastic. You really understand how people like Dawes honestly believe they were helping Lakotas. The Indian today is civilized only in the most elemental sense. We have reached the point where the Indian problem should be no different than the Irish problem or the German problem. But, unlike them, he has not yet been assimilated. Part of the problem with how we get so focused on military history is that we buy into the 19th century narrative of disappearing indigenous people. This was a social Darwinist idea that non-European peoples were disappearing as colonial settlers displaced them. And we hear this rhetoric in the movie used to justify assimilation. The Indian must have full citizenship and a deed in his hands like any white man. Assimilation, Charles, or extinction. Gentlemen. Not only that, but we hear this through a Sioux character who is the point of view for the audience. That is Charles Eastman, a Santee Dakota tribe member who became a prominent medical doctor. While he is not accurately portrayed, which we will talk about later, as the protagonist, he serves as a bridge for us, the viewers, into the weird 19th century world of Indian reform. He can be a difficult subject to tackle, but the fictionalization is... Uh, okay. Fine. It's necessary. We need to be able to understand why these things are happening, and we really do here. That is amazing. The most difficult part to do is the massacre. They tried to take a gun from a deaf man. They couldn't hear and they didn't care. This actually fits the book pretty well. As one witness later recalled, they came on and grabbed the gun that he was going to put down. Right after they spun him around, there was the report of a gun. It was quite loud. I couldn't say that anybody was shot, but following that was a crash. Unlike the book, they choose to include this. We didn't fire first. I swear to almighty God, we did not fire first. Humanizing the soldiers a bit is helpful, though the film neglects to show them double-tapping wounded Lakota or chasing down fleeing victims. Then again, the movie also chooses not to show too much of the massacre itself, including the 25 US soldiers who were killed in the fighting. 
There is a dispute over how many were killed by friendly fire, but we have some victims' accounts testifying to Lakota shooting back. Either way, I think the filmmakers did well here. We have a movie here that is good enough to be in classrooms and teach assimilation policy extraordinarily well. They hired mostly First Nations people for the Indian roles, and I don't really know if that's a good or a bad thing. Russell Means was certainly a controversial actor because of his activism, but he was Sue and still alive. Plus, they could have gotten Chask Spencer, Moses Springs Plenty, or Larry Sellers. Zahn McLarnon is the only Sue actor I recognize in the credits, but only for ADR voice casting, whatever that means. But the effort to hire American Indians in such roles is at least appreciated, whether or not they're from Canada. But let's not beat around the bush, this film has quite a split audience. Many Sioux were displeased, and that was for its inaccuracies. Some of the relatives of Sitting Bull actually walked out of a pre-screening of this film because of how it shows Sitting Bull. To my knowledge, this is actually a pretty accurate portrayal. To my ears, your words seem to come out of your rear end. This is to silence you. But to have that visceral of a reaction speaks to how sensitive a subject this remains. Also, portraying Dawes in a sympathetic light is off-putting to anyone. But as I've said before, you can't be accurate without being sympathetic. They could make him into a hateful bigot, but that would make the movie significantly worse as a result. There are two main inaccuracies I want to point out. One is minor. After the Battle of Little Bighorn, which begins the film, we hear this. They were attacked by us first. <laughs> While that is true in one sense, it completely misses the Deadwood Gold Rush that preceded it. In a way, the Great Sioux War could be seen as a defensive action by the United States. It was the miners themselves who illegally came to the Black Hills, and they were technically the aggressors. Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were the ones responsible for beginning raiding. What I'm trying to say is it is far more complicated than this scene makes it out to be. I mean, come on HBO, you had a Deadwood TV show, and it was actually going during the production of this film. You could have cross-promoted right there. More starkly inaccurate is what Charles Eastman does. He is the protagonist and goes through several things as our POV character, but much of that he did not actually experience. He didn't become a doctor until 1889, so he wasn't there for the Dawes Act, or even friends with Dawes himself. Even earlier in the story, he was not present for the Great Sioux War because he was not Lakota. He was Santee Dakota. He was a five-year-old kid during the Dakota War, and his mother had to flee that war. Him being split from his dad as a result of that war is accurate. 300 of us were to be hanged. I killed two whites, but the great father Lincoln saved me. He sent me to prison where my heart was made free. But obviously, the Great Sioux War and the Dakota War are a decade apart. I'm also not sure if I like the portrayal of his name. They make a big deal about him accepting a Christian first name. I would call on you, Ohayasa, but it must be by a white name. Have you chosen one from your book? Char! And this is how I came to be called Char. Eastman actually was his original last name. Eastman himself always talked about it as though he voluntarily took on a Christian name. That is a powerful scene, but it also seems to demean the real Eastman for doing it voluntarily. Not a good thing to refute your own protagonist's sympathies. Also, Eastman is portrayed as getting all broken up about assimilation after the massacre. As our POV, it makes sense, but once again, not to the real man. He did eventually separate from his wife, though it isn't clear why. But in reality, he continued lecturing on Indian rights, co-founded the Society of American Indians, attended the Universal Races Congress in London as a representative for all American Indians, and also helped found the Boy Scouts of America. Hell, he was instrumental in getting the Merriam Report started. He was no broken up old man. Look, I get that was necessary for the plot of the film. Certain fictionalizations are okay, but we can understand why this was a controversial film for some Sioux, right? 
it appropriates Eastman's story in a way Eastman wouldn't recognize himself. So the film has its problems. But I think it's still the best depiction of the problems of assimilation policy we've ever seen. So I wanted to add a quick addendum to the end of this video because um, it's been quite a lot of work and it's come at a pretty hard time for me personally. As you can tell, I recently had to move. I'm still trying to sort all that kind of stuff out. I also had my Jeep stolen because this is Albuquerque and you're not truly a resident until you've had your vehicle stolen. There's been a bunch of demonetizations on the channel. Um, for instance, 12 Strong was hit. I'm still really pissed off about the Veterans History video being hit. Um, the fact that YouTube is unwilling to see these videos as educational and, you know, helping their whole creators for change or their supposed support of, you know, trying to help veterans' issues. They're obviously unwilling to uphold what they supposedly advocate. So since I'm pretty sure this video is going to be demonetized given its subject matter, I'd like you guys to consider giving to my Patreon. I haven't talked about it in a while, but um, it's been there the whole time. There's a lot of really cool benefits. So for instance, I make these videos en masse during breaks, like right now, which is winter break. Tomorrow is when school starts. And at the $5 tier, I upload these way ahead of time and put them up there so that anybody who's donating $5 um, gets to see these way ahead of time, sometimes months. But there's a lot of really cool stuff, and since YouTube is unwilling to stand by its principles, please consider donating. It helps me deal with the demonetizations that YouTube is just clearly unwilling to stick by their own professed principles. And their whole education initiative is obviously unwilling to deal with anything that is truly educational. I don't want to have to make the kind of content that YouTube deems monetizable. I want to make history. 